Gang, welcome back again. If you if you've been here before, I'm Brandon Tolbert, and today we're talking design engineering. As mechanical engineers in this fast and growing workplace, we're expected to do more. And because we have mechanical engineering background, guess what? We're the hybrid engineers, man. If we were Olympic athletes, we would be the decathlon athletes. We'd be doing the sprints, the javelin throws, and all that, everything in between. I mean. In fact, I don't think Michael Phelps has anything on us. Just kidding. He's got 23 gold medals. But guess what? We are the hybrid engineers. So today, I'm going to talk about designing a casing stream in and, and oil and gas. If you're not familiar with the casing stream in oil and gas, it's essentially the pipe that goes way down into the ground. It's the straw that every drilling engineer puts in before they run in the tubing and extract oil and gas. And this design we're going to go into covers a lot of fundamental elements of mechanical engineering. It's going to include free body diagrams. Yeah, they're showing up again. If you hate free body diagrams, man, you're going to have a bad day. But also stress elements, worst case loading conditions, and some von Mises stress. So uh, just keep that in the back of your mind. These are things you need to be familiar with if you're going into this field. I see it a lot, uh, and I can draw parallels to almost any industry that they use every bit of this and you should be familiar with it so if you're scared guess what you better get unscared real fast because we're, we're gonna step into it and uh, I'll, I'll try to explain it as best I can and I'm sure you'll learn something from this so you guys get ready and let's go welcome back Mickey's yeah today we're gonna design I'm gonna show you how to design a combination production casing string for oil and gas so this shows a 2D representation of what a casing string consists of. Bang, you got drilling mud here on the outside. Bang, you got the production casing which we're designing. And bang, you got production tubing right here that's on the inside of the casing. And usually in the annulus you have completion fluid. So today I'm going to show you how to design this combination string in seven steps. So why do we design a combination string? Well, think about it. If I can use a lower grade, lighter weight casing at the top, and it does, it holds up to the conditions that we're designing it for, why wouldn't I do that? I mean, anybody can design a bridge, guys, but nobody can design a bridge that almost fails but never fails like mechanical engineers do. So the goal of casing design is essentially to design this casing string with the minimum grades and weights along the length of the string in order to obtain the lowest possible cost. That's what we do guys. We're smart, we're efficient, and that's what engineers think in terms of how do I design this so that it meets all the constraints. And so before we go into it, I want to show you kind of how this is physically set up. So on the outside you have drilling mud. So drilling engineers before they put casing into the ground, they have to drill down and uh, drill to depth. And in order to drill the depth, they got to put back pressure on the reservoir so that fluids don't come screaming out like a freight train and just blow out the well. Because if that happens, you better run for the hills because pipe is coming out of the hole and it's going to sling everywhere and it's going to be just fluids everywhere. It could be poisonous gas or, or sour gas. And, and I mean, it's a real bad situation. So drilling mud goes in right here and then you have the production casing they put production casing in in order to add stability to the formation it also helps isolate zones so that you reservoir engineers and production engineers can perf different zones and extract the oil and gas it also protects the tubing so some key concepts I want you I want to make you aware of before we go into casing design is design steps in general so before you design anything you gotta consider the worst case loading conditions in this case it's gonna be burst collapse and tension for our casing design process further we're gonna see biaxial load conditions in this scenario so biaxial means it's basically got two different loading conditions on it and then as design engineers we have safety factors because we can't account for every variable I mean corrosion is a variable um, you know the fatigue life those sort of things um, design safety factors help us uh, 
help save our design and preserve our design. Uh, another thing we're going to consider is joint strength. So let's get started, guys. Before we get into it, you got to think about the worst case loading conditions. What are we designing for? And so I mentioned earlier we have three different loading conditions on this casing. We have burst pressure, we have collapse pressure, and we have tension. And uh, so we're going to step in to look at these different scenarios and what we're designing for. So for the burst condition, we consider, consider a tubing leak at the surface and assume that this tubing is full of gas. Well, this gas will go through and leak into the annulus. And if the well is shut in, this pressure inside the annulus will equalize approximately to the reservoir pressure because this gas, it doesn't put too much hydrostatic head back on the reservoir. So we assume that in this situation that the pressure inside the, the annulus equalizes the reservoir pressure when the well is shut in. So this creates at the surface, if we consider a stress element at the surface, this pressure on the inside is going to be equal to reservoir pressure. But this hydrostatic mud column is not very tall at the surface. So there's really no pressure on the outside of this casing. So what does this has a tendency to do? Well, it has a tendency to blow up the casing or burst the casing at the surface under this scenario. So for the burst condition, in summary, you assume a gas column field annulus equal to the reservoir pressure. Another situation uh, could occur if you have a leak at the bottom of this tubing and you have low reservoir pressure, well this completion fluid can leak out. It can also leak out due to a packer leak. If this leaks out, then this annulus becomes empty. Well, at the near the bottom, if the completion fluid leaks out, you have an empty casing string, so the pressure is zero. And then you have a tall mud column on the outside, which produces hydrostatic pressure down at the bottom that's really high. So you have a lot of pressure pushing in at the bottom in this situation, and it tends to collapse the casing string. Another loading condition we consider is tension. Tension is basically caused by the weight of the string below the point that we're calculating our loads. So if you consider the first condition we were looking at, which was burst pressure, if you take an element at the top and you draw it over here to the right, here it is, you can see that the burst pressure is wanting to produce lateral strain outwards. And so if you add the tension effect to that, the tension effect, tension is actually trying to prevent lateral strain outwards. So in essence, tension has a beneficial effect on the burst pressure rating. It actually increases the burst pressure rating of your casing. And because it's benefits or it, it adds to the burst pressure rating, we normally don't consider it in our worst case analysis at the top of the casing. So at the top of the casing, we normally just consider burst pressure and don't include tension. Another loading condition location we evaluate is at the bottom of the top casing. This is where collapse pressure comes into effect. And as you can see here, it has to carry the load below it. So it actually has tension caused by the bottom casing. If you look at an element at this location, you can see collapse pressure is trying to squeeze this thing down and produce lateral strain uh, in inwards. Well, you can see here tension is is going to actually have a detrimental effect on collapse pressure. That is, it's going to produce more lateral strain in the direction that collapse pressure is is squeezing the casing. And so, this is where biaxial stress comes into play and we evaluate it at the top of the bottom casing using the ellipsoplasticity. And why do we do that? Because it will actually reduce the collapse pressure rating of the casing. And so this affects the depth at which you set the, the top of the bottom casing. And so this will actually, after several iterations, you're 
going to have to raise this this top casing reduce its setting depth and then the third location we look at is the bottom uh, where the bottom casing is the very bottom at TVD and you have no casing string below this point so there's no tension effect so we just evaluate collapse pressure at this point so in conclusion the tensile condition reduces the collapse resistance at the bottom of the top casing uh, in this scenario that we're looking at. So now that you have a good understanding of some of the casing design criteria, we're going to go into an actual problem of how to apply all this. So I want you, we're going to step through and design a 7 inch combination casing string consisting of two different types of casing and we're going to design it so that it can be put into a well that's drilled to 8,500 feet TVD and the data I want you to use is I want to use 10 and a half pound per gallon mud weight and I want you to use a formation pressure gradient of 0.465 psi per foot and then I want you to consider design safety factors into the design of these collapse tension and burst effects. So let's get started. So the first step is to size the bottom of the casing string by evaluating the collapse pressure condition. So once again, we consider an empty casing string and you can see this is the stress element. On the inside we have zero PSI and then on the outside we have the pressure caused by the hydrostatic head of the mud above it. So I don't want you guys to focus too much on the math, but it's shown here how to do it. And you can pause the video and basically work through it by yourself. And I think you'll really have a good understanding of what I'm talking about. So I'm going to kind of walk quickly through this, give you the gist, and then I expect you guys to go put in the actual work and to understand this. And if you have any questions, as always, just comment below. So the first thing I like to do, or the first thing you should do is you should calculate the mud pressure gradient because you're going to use this in several calculations down the road. So the mud weight is 10.5 pounds per gallon. You multiply it by a conversion factor and you get your mud pressure gradient. The next thing you want to do is calculate your collapse pressure at the bottom of this because you want to compare it to the different casings uh, strings and you want to pick a casing string that has a higher collapse pressure than what you calculate so this is simply just going to be your mud hydrostatic pressure head per times the length of the well which is going to be 80,500 feet and then you multiply it by the design factor and so we get an answer of 4,873 PSI. So you got to choose a casing that has a higher collapse pressure rating than this. And so if you go to the Halliburton handbook, which I'm going to show you here, you're going to select this C-75 grade casing that's 26 pounds per foot. It has a collapse pressure rating of 5,250 PSI. And so let's go step into the handbook to show where I found this. Just remember that your your pressure here that you're des you have to exceed is 4,870 psi. So this is the Halliburton E Red Book. You can download it for free at their website, and it's a really good resource for casing design. It's got several uh, technical uh, data different casing strings and you can do lots of things I haven't really explored it too much but you can definitely use it for s designing casing S so you want to cl click on dimensions and strengths what you have here is you have different size casing and we're designing seven inch casing so we want to go down to seven inches that's our design criteria then you have the grade and then you have the weight per foot which you're gonna need you have basically the inside diameters and then you know the outside diameter it's seven inches and then you also have the collapse resistance and this is what we're we're comparing our value to and so remember 
our value was 4,800 PSI. So we want to choose a casing string that basically is can be designed for that. And so you can look here, this first one right here, 23 pound per foot C-75 grade casing, it's not going to be built strong enough to do what we want it to do. But if you go down below that, this casing string right here is sufficient because it exceeds our collapse pressure rating and so this is what we would want to put at the bottom of our casing string is 26 pound per foot C75 casing so this is the one I would select so for our bottom casing string we pick this 26 pound per foot casing step two we size the top casing by evaluating the burst pressure condition that we discussed earlier so if you recall for the burst pressure condition, we assume the annulus is equal to reservoir pressure. At the surface, our stress element has reservoir pressure exerting a stress on the inside of the casing, and then on the outside of the casing, we assume the hydrostatic mud pressure gradient is zero PSI. So to calculate the burst pressure, we essentially take the formation pressure gradient, multiply it by total depth which gives us reservoir pressure and then we multiply that by a design safety factor that we specified earlier and the value we get is 4,545 PSI. So we take this value to the Halliburton handbook and we try to find a casing that is strong enough to uh, not burst under this pressure and so the value that I picked, or the casing that I picked, was C-75, 23 pound per foot casing. And so the values, the burst pressure for that casing was 5,940 PSI, which exceeds our calculated value, so we're good to go there. And then you're also going to want the collapse pressure, which is given in the handbook, and the yield strength of this casing. And so um, it's important to note that the yield strength is actually given by the number in the grade, so in thousands of pounds. So 75 means this casing, C-75, has a yield strength of 75,000 pounds. So let's go to the Halliburton Handbook, and I'll show you where I found these values. So we go to our... Halliburton handbook and the burst pressure rating is actually called internal yield pressure so this is what you want to compare that value to and if you look go down to 7 inch casing you can see here that this value right here exceeds our 4500 or whatever burst pressure so this is the grade casing you want to use and see how it was a step down from the collapse pressure casing that's great that's good because we're using a lower weight casing at the top and so you'll want to take these values um, from here your diameters your ODID your burst pressure ratings and all that right here so you'll choose this one at the top step three is to calculate the length of the top casing string taking into account the collapse pressure so in the previous example we are able to get our collapse pressure of the top casing from the handbook. So essentially, we to do that calculation, we use this formula, and we end up sizing our casing to 6,576 feet. And recall that all we did was we took the collapse pressure, divided it by the mud pressure, hydrostatic pressure gradient, and then the design factor so we use the same formula we used previously to calculate collapse pressure we just rearranged it to calculate length step four is to take into account the biaxial load condition and so for the collapse pressure we can see here it's going to going to be detrimentally affected by the tension load and so first thing is to calculate the weight below the 
bottom of the casing string. So you can see your stress element here and you calculate your weight, which is going to be just the weight of the casing string, 26 pounds per foot, multiplied by the difference in height between TVD and the length of the top string, and you end up getting 50,025 pounds. And then you want to calculate the stress caused by that tension load, and that's simply just going to be um, the force over area. And so you take your weight load, and you divide it by the cross-sectional area of the top casing string. And we rem remember we got these values from the handbook. And so you end up with a tension of 7,516 PSI. So you can see, once you do that, you're going to want to go to a chart. They call it the ellipse of plasticity. And don't, don't get caught up in the name. It's just it's a stress, biaxial stress curve that's derived from von Mises stress. And what it essentially tells you is it tells you how much your collapse pressure rating is reduced by the tension load. So the first thing you want to do, you can see this chart below. This is the percent of average yield stress of the tension load. So it's you take your yield stress and you take the tension load you calculated previously and you find the ratio of that and you get a percentage. You multiply it by 100 to get a percentage. You go down to this bottom graph, which is just this right here. That's the x-axis. And you go to 10% and then you go up to intersect this curve. Well, the y-axis here is going to show your percentage reduction <coughs> in collapse pressure rating so it actually is going to be you take your collapse pressure rating and you multiply it by 0.95 and that'll give you your new collapse pressure rating so the combination load this shows you that it reduces the collapse resistance at the bottom of the top casing string and so this is where it gets a little bit tedious um, there's two methods to calculate the new setting depth of the casing string. This is the long one. Method one is an iterative approach. So essentially what you do is you take your old collapse pressure rating of the top casing string, you multiply it by that value determined from the ellipse of plasticity, and you get your new collapse pressure rating. Okay, And because the the stress varies linearly with depth. You can just take that percentage value and multiply it by the previous setting length to get your new setting depth. And so if you take the old setting depth and you multiply it by basically it's 6,576 feet and you multiply it by 95% you get your new collapse or new length of the top string and you continue to do this iteration iterative process until you get minor changes in the setting depth so for the second iteration we're going to do the same thing we're going to take our new setting depth we're going to calculate the weight below the string and then you're going to take that and calculate your tensional load and then you're going to calculate the ratio between the tension load and the yield stress of the part, you get 12%. And so if you go to the ellipse of plasticity and follow that same process, what you're going to do is you're going to go to the x-axis, go to 12%, and then go up to where you intersect the curve. And that occurs approximately at 94%. So you'll take that value and multiply it by the the original setting depth of the casing which is 6,576 feet and your new setting depth is 6,181 feet and so you continue to do that iterative process and on the next iteration you'll find that you get the same setting depth so then that's where you would stop and say I'm good so that's a little bit tedious and not very efficient but there's this great rule of thumb, and I'm going to show you that in method two. So method two 
is a much easier method and it gives great results uh, close to the iterative approach. And so where this equation comes from, I learned this equation in school and it's a lot easier to do it this way than the iterative approach. Although I don't discourage you not to know the iterative approach, this is a good way to do a hand calc. And so what you have is the formula is right here. You take the first original percent collapse resistance, which was 95%, and you take 100 and subtract that value, and then you multiply it by 1.5. So you can see that calculation is done here. You, you end up with 92.5%, and then you multiply this by the s setting depth of the original value, and you end up with 6,083 feet. Well, guess what? If you compare that to the one calculated by the iterative approach, it's really only a 100 foot difference. And that's really, if the casing stand is 30 feet, that's only three casing strings, stands of casing difference, which is not, which is basically nothing. And plus, another benefit of this approach is it adds additional factor of safety because you're sizing that casing a little bit higher than you would with the iterative approach so essentially you can do this in <laughs> basically two lines and be done and it's more conservative and uh, it's actually a safer way to do the calculation The last step is to calculate the joint strength. Yeah, we're going back to free body diagrams because that is, that's just going to constantly show up in design. And so we're going to consider the top joint because this joint is taking all the load below it. It's carrying the weight of this casing. So a lot of times it'll be, this casing will sit on a hanger and this top joint is stressed the highest. And so um, here's our casing design, our final design, and we're using the rule of thumb to design this. And I draw on a simplified free body diagram to the right. And basically you make a cut at the top of the casing, which is shown here, and then it's got to carry the load of all the weight below it. So if you do your equilibrium equations, you end up with a force balance, and this F subscript J is going to be the force on your that your joint has to carry. So if we do this calculation, we get a value of 2,000, basically 200,000 pound force that that top joint has to hold. And if you go back to your handbook, the the failure condition of the top joint is going to be close to 500,000 pounds. So we fall under that. So we're good. So this casing string is good to go. And so it, the joint top joint has sufficient strength to hold this thing. And now all you have to do is basically summarize what you did. And so basically what we did is we the design is summarized in this table right here. So we're going to set 23 pound per foot casing with a grade of C-75. We're going to set that to a depth of 6,083 feet and we're going to use long threads because that's what was in the handbook that was the joints that we used or the, the threads we used. And then we're going to set the bottom casing is going to be 26 pounds per foot grade C-75 and it's going to be set between the depth of 6,083 and 80,500 feet. So that's it guys. We size casing with a simple hand calculation. That is just the way to do it. If you can't do hand calculations, you, you know, you're, no, you're really not an engineer because at the end of the day, that's really the only way you can make sense of what you're doing. And so in summary, we s developed or sized a combination casing string in seven steps and so that's it guys we used we covered a lot of things we covered stress elements we covered worst case loading conditions design factors and free body diagrams and so this design process encompasses a lot of those things and so I hope you got something out of this and if you have any questions guys just go back through the video 
work through it and then at, you know I'll be glad to answer your questions if you're still confused so guys that's it we're done way to go there we have it guys you designed a multi combination casing string using hand calculations so essentially when you go do your software design or something you have a basic understanding of what you're designing for instead of just putting in numbers and having them spit out an answer so that's why we go through these steps this is why we need to understand the fundamentals so that we can make sense of the results and also sometimes that calculation is more robust you can see we applied design safety factors based on experience of from somebody else's uh, career or, or work experience so these are the things that we do as design engineers we, we can make assumptions and still get a good result um, by considering worst case loading conditions and also doing stress analysis with fundamental equations so there you have it guys um, you can take this and extend it to multi strings um, containing three or more casings um, you can you can do just about anything uh, with with this method and that's why I like to use it and uh, it makes sense and I hope it makes sense to you if it doesn't please leave a comment down below and I'll answer that to the best of my knowledge and uh, you guys keep it up man you guys keep coming back and learning more because I really want to share this information with y'all I want you guys to grow and get better and that's really a, the objective of this channel to spread my knowledge and uh, so that it benefits y'all so um, y'all have a good one I'll see you next time. Adios.